everyone, John Michael Swift here, and we're going to start a series today I call Elevator Etudes. Elevator Etudes is a concept I have about bringing practice and performance together. So basically, you're practicing while you're performing. Um, if you need to find different parts of this lesson or you feel you want to jump around, use the lesson navigator below in the description box. It'll have little timestamps to jump around this video as you need. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think with that, I'm about ready to get into it. So, you know, the the basic idea is we're starting with a piece that folks know, and we're going to expand on a bunch of ways to improvise on it in ways that'll expand your technique. So the piece is, of course, Romanza. It's a famous uh, classical piece. It sounds a little like this. Etc. Etc. So a lot of folks know this piece, but what I'm going to talk about is a whole bunch of different ways to improvise on different sections of it, or just to more than any of it's ways to kind of build your own improvisations and things that'll work your own technique in ways that you're interested in. So one of the first things that I like to do with this piece is do modal improvisations on one string. A lot of folks who haven't learned a lot of theory yet, haven't learned a lot about intervals or modes or anything, this is like a perfect piece for them to learn about it with because you can be making music kind of while you're learning all the theory. So the thing I usually start with is just kind of going up and down the thin E string and trying to just find the notes of the scale I want to use. And the main scale of this song is just the regular minor scale, your Aeolian mode. So your root is your open E string. Your second is on the second fret, so you have a major second. You have a minor third, which is on the third fret. So you just kind of mess with those a little bit until they're in your head. Your next note is your A. It's the perfect fourth. It's up on the fifth fret. So kind of mess around with those notes. So they're kind of in your head. Um, seventh fret, perfect fifth is the next thing. Do what you need to do to kind of get all these things in your head and start working in patterns as you go up a little bit. So next, you got five, seven, eight. That's a flat six right there. That's a, a, a minor sixth right there. Uh, that's kind of a dark note, so that's a good one to have. Mix that in with the ones you have. Next we have 10 on the E string. 10 is your minor seventh. And last of all, 12th fret. 12th fret's your high octave. So see if you can kind of just play through your whole scale. And that are, that's kind of like the field of notes you're going to work with. The next thing I try to do is sort of establish this pattern, because just kind of ripping the pattern out of this song works really well to kind of give us a base of stuff to work with. So the key idea is on your right hand, you're going, you're pinching on the downbeat, you're playing the thumb and the ring finger on the outer strings, and then you're going middle finger, pointer finger on the second and third strings. So you're going pinch, pluck, pluck, pinch, pluck, pluck. And you kind of want to count that in groups of four if you can. If it were me, I'd go one and uh, two and uh, three and uh, four and uh, one and uh, two and uh, three and uh, four. And, uh... and what I would do is I would kind of count that in measures of three because in the song it's kind of in sort of nine eight really. So it goes. It, it kind of pinches on the downbeat and then just follows with three of these finger patterns. So it goes pinch, pluck, 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 pinch, pluck, pluck, pluck. So it goes one and a two and a three and a one and a two and a three and one and a two and a three and a one and a two and a three and a one. And you can slow down and play along with that if you need to. But again, that's a really good way to kind of get down some finger mechanics of basic finger picking. And again, that you're going to see that pattern is going to serve us wildly well. So now we're just going to kind of put these things together. Um, if you can, just kind of let any finger 
any time, play any note in that scale over that pattern and just see what you get coming out of it. If I do it, it looks a little bit like this. So you can start to get a basic sense of kind of how this mode sounds and how the different intervals sound just by playing over this because this picking pattern gives you sort of an E minor drone. It's a very safe drone. It's really hard to get things that sound really bad going with this. So it's a really kind of safe space to sort of mess around with this mode and with this pattern. Um, but of course, it's like the, the trick to really make it sound like a nice improvisation is to start to work on phrasing. So if you find you can just play that and have it sound awesome, go ye forth, play with it. And the and the next thing I would say, mess with if you feel in it, is to start to move certain notes. The only note you can't really use, I really wouldn't use the fourth fret at all in this because like you, you got the open G string, it's gonna sound kind of funky. You have a split third there, but you, know, you got uh, you know, seven other basic notes in this scale and I guess really uh, at least five of the other ones can be moved up or down. So like this note, your your major second can be moved down to a minor second. Make it kind of dark, make it kind of Phrygian. So you can kind of like sub that into your improv. Your fourth can be raise one. That sounds real funky right there, but you can do that. You can kind of mix and match these as you like. Your seventh fret, you really want to leave where it is. It's an important point of stability. And it's also kind of in your drone there, so I really wouldn't move it if I if I were you. But I mean, generally speaking, as long as you don't use kind of this fourth fret and you always keep the seventh fret in there, you can kind of switch the positions of the other notes. So your sixth here, you, you got a flavor of C here. Normally we're gonna use the flat six in the song, but there's, it actually sounds really nice to raise that up to, I guess that'd be the ninth fret. Make it kind of Dorian for a second. is your minor seventh. You can raise that up to a major seventh. I'm kind of mixing and matching that with the uh, the minor sixth here. So you got this big wide gap here. But it makes it sound kind of exotic. So if you really want to kind of just mess with scales and get to know some different things, that's just a really easy but fun way to mess around with modes and just get a sense. And you can really see exactly where all the intervals are on the guitar because they're just kind of laid out there for you on one string. Um, what I'd really try to do is be conscious of where you are and which notes you've moved where. And again, it's okay if you drift. I mean, a lot of my improvisations with this, they sound a little like this. You know? Sometimes I do that on purpose, but you know what? Even if you do it by accident, this is one of those cases where you can totally kind of call it jazz, and, but try to have a place where you come back to. Because if you just hit totally random stuff all the time, it does sound a little bit weak, but if you occasionally drift onto a wrong note, your audience isn't necessarily gonna know. There's no objective reason why it's wrong, especially if you purposely use a couple of chromatic changes on purpose early on in your improvisation. So whatever kind of improv you come up with, a lot of times I'll be like, all right, here's my minor scale. Start an outline my minor scale. I'll just throw in a, you know, you know, kind of, you know, I just use both, you know, both kinds of sixths right there very early on. Just to say, you know what? Audience, don't get too attached to anything because you never know what I'm gonna do. Um, and that kind of gives you a little bit of leeway to make some mistakes, but to also start to channel yourself onto one particular sound you want. So there's the first kind of set of things to play with. Once you've really got that established, it's really time to like start thinking about phrasing. So the, uh, the, the, the first thing we're talking about is just notes. Whenever you set up a modal improvisation of any kind, there's gonna be some notes that sound tense and some notes that sound more restful. 
generally speaking, not absolutely, but generally speaking, your the notes of your tonic triad are going to be the resting notes. So this isn't necessarily true for Indian music or for Arabic music, but in things that are kind of inspired by European, anything based on European music with chords, your your triad of your basic note is going to be considered the most restful notes. So if we're in E minor, you know, E, of course, our, you know, our open E string, that's our most restful note, that's our do. You know, our re, we kind of skip over that, it's kind of tense. Your, me, your may right there, I guess it's, you know, me to some people, but lower uh, me is may. That's a pretty restful note. And that, again, it's right here in our drone, our open G string. So that's a restful note. Skip another note. And then when you get to the seventh fret there, perfect fifth. So these three notes, those are kind of your resting notes. And you can, of course, use a high octave too. So you've got four resting notes in the range we got. You got the 12th fret, seventh fret, the third fret, and the open string. And it kind of goes without saying that all the other notes are tense notes. It doesn't mean you don't play them. If you didn't play them, everything would be boring. But it just kind of to mark them out. Your second fret, your major second, it's pretty, but it's a little tense. Your perfect fourth, and also pretty, but you know wants to resolve. Your minor sixth, maybe on the eighth fret, and the flat seven on the tenth fret. All those notes want to go somewhere else. Now, again, this does not mean we avoid them. It means that you use them intentionally to build the dynamics of your phrase. So the first thing I want you to mess with is, you know, almost forget the cycle. Keep it the finger pattern we were on. But try to just go, you know, pinch the first note, but then just start letting this, just let your plucking fingers roll. Forget about the bass note and just start messing with notes. Start purposely, you know, go to a resting note, pass through some resting note, and then take a second and go to a tense note and just sit there for a second. And then release it. And do it again. Tension, 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 release. idea of tension and release you don't need anything other than the notes that you have and what's really helpful to do when you want to kind of mark what I generally try to do is an improvisation where you're using this pattern you're aware of your notes and what you try to do is you only pinch when you want to switch between tense and release and you want to really purposely alternate between tense and release so I'm gonna pinch right on my downbeat because I'm on my dough doing this pattern and start walking some stuff but then I'm gonna land on a tense note and pinch again start walking again and then release note and pinch again and you can kind of go whenever you want to any other thing but you kind of mark tense part of the phrase and I can stay here as long as I want Ready, release. And so, the, so another really important idea here is this idea that this bass is, is a marker. It's a marker that your ears are trying to figure out, you know, this means something. So you can use it different ways, but that's a really specific idea of how you can use it to kind of mark tense phrases and release phrases. Another thing you can do is use rhythmic cycles. Now, these are a little harder to manage, um, but you really got, the key is you got to set something up. So if we go back to this idea of one and If you do that regularly, your ears will get used to it. Tense note. Release. And tense. Sort of release. Now I'm really releasing. And part of that, if you set it up in what's called four square phrase this kind of lets you set up like a larger phrase structure it's like generally you want to set up a point in a listener's ear when they want everything to kind of come back together the rhythm and the melody so uh so we're going to set up what we're going to call it a, a four bar cycle where we go we, where if you first before you do anything just pluck it and count it 
Let's go one and a two and a three and a two and a two and a three and a three and a two and a three and a four and a two and a three and a one. When you get that one, that's when everything's going to come back together. So you kind of change the number that you count at the beginning of each bar. And at the end of four bars, you want to try to land on a resting note. So let me give you an example of that. Here we go. So one and a two and a three and a oh, two and a two and a three and a oh, three and a two and a three and a oh, four and a two and a three and a oh, one. On that B right. you're starting to play with something a little bigger, the expectations of the audience. And that really comes from setting different things up, but using these important phrase markers, like what notes you're using and where things go in, the, in a rhythmic cycle that you set up to kind of create a sense of tension and release. So start out by trying to do something free and just using the notes to set your tension and release profiles up. But then you can start to bring rhythm into it as you start to get better at it and more consistent with it. And then if stuff falls off the track as you go on, it's actually not bad because you want to try to build wider and wider arcs that you find your way back from. So this is the kind of thing where you just keep messing around with it. And if you eventually change how you do get you get your ideas across or you discover other devices to play with that's okay but these are more just kind of things to think about to help you kind of understand how people hear improvisations and how you can kind of take your audience on a little journey with you so start messing with that post some videos of the things you do with this i'd love to hear in the comments if people come up with other ideas for ways to play with this exercise and yeah in the next video i'm gonna start to give you more things to mess with with the song because we have barely scratched the surface so Ah, it's a lesson for me, so I gotta go. Bye-bye.